Errol Spence is one of the few southpaws who uses the jab as a main tool in the southpaw versus orthodox matchup. He uses it in every single one of his fights, and he does this to control distance, rack up points, set up his left hand, offset his opponent's rhythm, and cover his entry into an inside fight, to name a few. A big key to how he is able to execute this jab without getting countered is by shooting the jab at the maximum distance or to his orthodox opponent's lead hand so that he has plenty of space to see a counter coming. You see Spence shoots the touch jab, and this is only to the lead hand of Ugas. It isn't meant to do damage, but it's enough to stop Ugas from walking in, and it's also difficult to counter due to how far away he is shooting it from. However, fighting a skilled counterpuncher like Jordanis Ugas, who also has a similar height and reach to Spence, showed early on that he was prepared for this jab and was able to counter over the top with his own jab and actually reach Spence. As you can see, Ugas counters right over the top of that long jab from Spence. And once again, you can see him counter over the top of that long jab. And once again, Spence shoots the jab and Ugas counters right over the top. Uh, again, we're gonna see Spence is going to shoot the jab from long range and Ugas counters over the top with the jab. However, you see in this example, Spence makes a slight adjustment where he ducks down from the counter jab and stops on the inside. You see he still gets clipped a little bit by the jab, but he is able to successfully work his way onto the inside. And from there, he lands a big left hand to the body under Ugas's guard. And this seemed to be a turning point in the fight, because as you can see in the next round, Spence comes in with two jabs and is not countered by Ugas. But Spence still level changes to duck under in case the counter jab does come. And from there he's able to get on the inside and land a big left hand to the body, which you see bothers Ugas. It seemed as though Spence's adjustment of stepping in under the counter jab made Ugas completely abandon it. And this is bad because that counter jab is Ugas' best tool to control distance and keep Spence from walking in and beating him up on the inside, which is what happens after this because Spence is much more comfortable on the inside than Ugas is. This is the tool that Ugas used to keep Manny Pacquiao off of him, which is the last southpaw he fought as well. So abandoning this tool is going to spell doom for him. As you see, he doesn't counter Spence's jab, which allows Spence to follow up to the body. So now that Ugas has abandoned his one tool to control the distance, it's time to get to the fun part and talk about Errol Spence's inside fighting. So after Errol Spence misses his left hand, you see that they clinch, but Ugas treats this clinch as time to rest until the ref breaks them up. Spence, who has shown to be the much more comfortable fighter on the inside, will take advantage of this position and continue fighting. So as you can see, Spence steps his left foot back to get him back into his southpaw stance. But more importantly, this creates hip separation from Ugas. This gives Spence the space needed to punch, and you can also see he disengages his left arm so that he could punch with it. His left arm wasn't stuck in an underhook the way his right arm is, so he could pull his left arm away whenever he wants. So he uses it to dig a body shot and then a left hook. But notice he doesn't stop there and steps his left foot around and Spence's step to the left with his rear foot positioned him to Ugas's right, turning Ugas southpaw. Spence also still has his left hand free to punch, so now Ugas has to change his position in order to protect himself. So we see Ugas is going to adjust his feet to get back into his fighting position in orthodox, and as he does this, Spence clocks him with another left hook. You see Spence stepped to a position that forced Ugas out of his orthodox stance. This forced Ugas to adjust to get back into his orthodox stance, and while he was doing this, Spence took the opportunity to land another hook. And this is because Spence understands the concept of changing your position to force your opponent to change theirs, and while they are changing their position, you should be punching. So Ugas habitually shells into the high guard, and this allows Spence to follow up with more hooks around the high guard. In this next sequence, Spence shows the lead hand to bait out the counter jab and then ducks down to avoid it and also get onto the inside. And Ugas concedes to the inside fight when he could have stepped back to reset and possibly land a punch while Spence is bent down out of position. But since he stays here where Spence wants him, we're going to see Spence go to work on him again. 
So once again, Spence steps back to create hip separation, giving him the space to dig a left hook to the body. From there, Spence re-engages onto the inside with a shoulder wedge to pin Ugas' gloves to his head. And since Ugas is in the high guard, he is open around the flanks. However, Spence's shoulder wedge blocks Ugas' vision from anything coming from his left hand. So you see Spence shoots an uppercut right up the middle that Ugas can't see. However, in this next example, we're going to see Spence step in again and he creates a forearm wedge with his left arm on the inside to pin Ugas' gloves in the high guard. This sets up his right hand free to attack around the blind spot. Notice Spence also stepped in his lead foot outside of Ugas' lead foot and also positions his head on the same side as his right hand is on. This is blocking Ugas' vision of that right hand so he's free to attack with it. But Ugas realizes he's open for the hook and rolls under it and counters Spence. And because Spence didn't control Ugas after he missed the right hook, he allowed Ugas to counter him. Spence could have used his missed hook to push down on Ugas' head or grab onto him con to control him. And you see control is key for inside fighting as it allows you to prevent return fire. To see an example of this, we see Floyd Mayweather against Andre Berto. He misses the right hook, but he uses that missed right hook to transition to head control to prevent a counter shot from Birdo. And from there, he's able to set up another shot. And as you see, as he misses that left hook, he uses that same hook to control Birdo again. So if Spence used any control after this missed right hook, he could have prevented Ugas from throwing a counter, as control is key. In this next sequence, we see Spence come in with jabs, and Ugas doesn't counter it with his own jab. As a matter of fact, he ducks down and braces for a body punch because he's so worried about Spence ducking down and shooting a body blow. And so Spence uses this opportunity to control Ugas while he's down there. So from the control, he lands an uppercut, and then Spence uses another shoulder wedge to pin Ugas' gloves into a high guard and positions himself in the way so that his head is on Ugas' right shoulder, which blocks Ugas' vision of his left hand, which is free to punch. The shoulder wedge also makes Spence's stance naturally bladed, which gives him the hip separation on his left side so that he has space to punch. Spence can actually throw anything with his left hand and Ugas won't be able to see it coming from here. From here, Ugas' only choice is to step back, or even better, step around to his left away from Spence's left hand. Otherwise, he will eat a left hand if he stays there, unless he guesses correctly, like the last time. However, Spence has already cut off Ugas' escape option to the left by stepping his own lead foot on the outside of Ugas' lead foot. This leaves Ugas no choice but to step back. And from here, Spence gives him another uppercut, beautifully set up. And just one more example, Spence is going to step right into the inside again because Ugas has completely abandoned his jab. And so Spence is going to create another shoulder wedge, this time with his left shoulder. And from here, Ugas cannot see Spence's right hand, as his body and his head is hiding his right hand. And so Ugas is already pretty close to the ropes, so his best option here is to step to his right, away from Spence's free right hand. However, this is a trap from Spence. It's a trap! It's a trap! Instead of throwing the right hand and letting Ugas dodge it and get away, instead he lets Ugas step out to his right, and he quickly cuts him off and steps with him. Now Spence has his left side, which is his power side, free to use, and is even in the outside lead foot position, giving Ugas no escape left. And from there, Spence is going to uppercut the Titan Ugas's high guard, and then shoot the hook around that Titan high guard. And it was after this attack that Ugas' eye really started to swell up. But that's going to be it for this one. The rest of the fight is just more sequences like these. Ugas abandoning his counter jab after the second round was the beginning of the end, as I felt it was his biggest key to victory. It was his main tool to keep Spence off of him, and he was never going to keep up with Spence when the fight got on the inside. He showed he had no other tools prepared once Spence scared him away from using the jab. Ugas is also relatively flat-footed, so once Spence does get on the inside, Ugas was unlikely to have the foot speed to get away. Ugas's best chance, as many people believed, was to keep the fight at long range, like he did against Manny Pacquiao, with distance control mainly coming from his jab and from counters. 
But now it's looking like the, the big fight with Terence Crawford is finally going to happen and I'm ready to beat my meat every day till then. So thank you all for watching and big thanks to my GOAT tier patrons as usual, Jason Mahinen, Grant Gabriel, Albert Chen, Jeff, Dmitry Drozdov, Andre, and Gostolai Geza. You guys keep the channel going and I'll see you guys all in the next one. Thank you all for watching.